All right. Um, got it about time. There's a lot more people in the meeting right now. There might be still some people trying to get in through the waiting room. Um, welcome to this session. My name is uh, Wouter Hochkamer. I'm an assistant professor at UMass and you're attending the session uh, Sports Performance. Uh, I got two co-moderators today. Uh, we got uh, Laura Healy, um, who is going to introduce herself quickly, if she can unmute. Hi, I'm Laura. I'll be co-moderating the session. I'm a researcher at the University of UMass uh, under Rotor. And we also got Shanice Thomas here. Hi, I'm Shanice and I'm a PhD student at the University of Houston in Texas. So since it's the first parallel session going on during this virtual ASB, just a quick rundown. The way we're going to do this is we're going to have three blocks of four talks and each talk is going to be five minutes. And then we don't have any questions right at that time, but um, we'll have four talks. Then we got 10 minutes of questions and then um, we're going to start the next block of four talks and have 10 minutes of questions. The way we're going to try to do the questions is everybody can type their questions in the chat function and then Shanice or Laura or myself will read out the question to one of the speakers and then the speakers have this opportunity to answer the questions. It's not going to be ideal, but that's the way we're going to try to do this. We're also having uh, the Slack channel where uh, we can move discussions later, everything from the chat. The chat is the whole Zoom session is recorded. The chat is going to be moved uh, towards um, the Slack discussion as well. And um, we can encourage people and, and people could reach out to the speaker either through Slack or messages in the crowd uh, environment uh, and, and follow up on any discussions there. Um, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, I think I've said everything I was supposed to say. Um, so we're going to start it off with the first talk in this sports performance session, which is by uh, Sarah Wilson, who is going to be talking about downhill skiing, IMUs, and SPM. Sorry, one moment here. Hey everybody, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm a research engineer at the Stedman Philippon Research Institute. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of our exploratory data analysis approaches from our pilot work using SPM on IMU data from alpine skiing. Uh, Stedman is located in Vail, Colorado, and we see a lot of ski injuries in our clinic. Knee injuries are the most common, but we also see a lot of concussions, fractures, that kind of thing, and skiers of all ability levels. Um, skiing is really challenging to measure in the lab, as you can imagine, uh, but with the improving functionality and accuracy of wearable tech, we're starting to be able to explore the sports biomechanics on the mountain in the real world. Um, in our study, we recruited advanced recreational skiers uh, before the mountain shut down for quarantine. We had two women and two men um, set up on this course here on Vail Mountain. Um, each skier had um, an eight sensor IMU system and we used both the kinematics and the gyroscope signals from the foot sensors. Um, in skiing, we say that there's only two ways to turn a ski. You can either tip it or you can twist it. So we focused on the gyroscope data in the axes corresponding to ski edging and ski twisting. Um, there's a lot of vibration and chatter on the ski. So we start by uh, aggressively filtering the gyroscope data. And then we use algorithms that had been uh, previously defined in the literature to determine when turn transition happens. Um, and then from there, we extract the kinematics and inertial data of the middle three turns in each direction and resample everything to the same number of uh, frames per turn. And that's where we get to SPM. Um, SPM is a really critical tool for skiing analysis because turns are such a fluid movement. You don't have discrete events like heel strike uh, to guide you in your analysis. And there's such a wide variety of skiing movement tactics and techniques that things like maximum knee flexion, wouldn't have the same context that they would in a, in a movement like a jump landing. Um, 
And so SPM is really critical because it lets us look at the entire turn without biasing ourselves to any specific time points or losing information by averaging over the entire turn cycle. Um, we ran SPM on both the inertial data and on the kinematics, and we looked at a couple of different comparisons. First off, looking uh, within an individual at multiple turns to see how similar those are, and then looking at differences between an individual's left and right turns in a symmetry context. And then we can also use this to look at differences between individuals in more of a performance context. Um, the first thing you have to do when looking at this kind of data is determine whether it's okay to average multiple trials together. Um, it might be reasonable to assume that multiple gate cycles are repeatable, but in a ski race, the course setters try to make each turn different to challenge the athletes, and that's not to mention changes in pitch and snow conditions. Um, so to standardize things, we tried to set our course as symmetrically as possible. And then unlike a ski race where you might only get one or two runs through the course, our skiers each took four runs through the course. Um, and then we then assumed that it was safe to average the data from the same turn on the course across those four runs. Um, in the graph on the left here, you can see each blue line represents the first right turn on the course. Um, the red lines represent the second right turn, et cetera. Um, and we then ran a repeated measures and NOVA comparing um, each set of right turns. And it turns out that we did a pretty good job of setting a consistent course where all the turns were the same size and shape. Um, you can see here on the right that we're nowhere close to hitting this significance threshold, which indicates that our turns are not significantly different. Um, however, this significance threshold is pretty high relative to the, the data, so that indicates that we're probably a little underpowered with only uh, four turns per, uh, or four repetitions of each turn. Um, but from this evaluation, we did decide that it was valid to average together all of the subjects' left turns and all of their right turns. Um, in a more comprehensive analysis, we would probably want to look at all of the planes of the gyroscope data, um, the accelerometer data, and probably consider the kinematics um, before making that assumption as well. Um, but from here, we can start to look at side-to-side -side symmetry. Um, when looking at the outside leg during um, turns in both directions. Skier one showed significant difference in their knee flexion between the left and right sides um, over a lot, pretty large portions of the turn, um, whereas the other three skiers did not have nearly as much variability leg to leg. Um, now, one thing to consider here is that if you have a, a ski slope with any amount of double fall line, you could really easily see bias to one side. So you have to carefully evaluate whether that asymmetry is inherent to the athlete or if it's inherent to the course. Um, but if one athlete demonstrates much more asymmetry than other athletes on the course, like what we observed here, uh, that could be a cause for concern in an injury prevention or a performance context. Um, and so then we start getting into differences between athletes. Um, now this was just a proof of concept using a small number of recreational skiers, but we did see significant differences in knee angle strategies between every pair of those skiers. Um, whereas their inertial data was much more consistent. Um, so this really underscores that in skiing, everybody's skis have to follow more or less the same path to go around the gates. So you're going to see pretty similar inertial data, but you can use a huge variety of skiing styles and movement strategies to achieve that. Um, part of this too is that the inertial data is so noisy from the ski chatter and so heavily filtered that we lose a lot of the details about how the ski is moving, whether it's carving or skidding and exactly what line it's taking. Uh, now that said, from an injury prevention and biomechanics standpoint, the kinematics are probably more significant anyway. Um, we're really excited to continue expanding this approach this coming winter to get a better ideal data set on our course, which would allow us to identify more subtle movement differences between elite skiers and recreational skiers, um, and then start identifying some of those asymmetries that could be a risk factor for injury. Um, we're also constantly looking for ways to make this research stronger. Um, so right now we're pursuing a GPS system to get better repeatability in our course setting between days um, so that we know that those gates are in exactly the same place for every skier on the course. Um, and it would also allow us to track skier position on the course to better define when turn transition happens because we're a little skeptical of the algorithms that have been um, established in the literature for, for choosing those time points. And that really skews your SPN if you're not uh, looking at the same turn cycle for everybody. Um, 
And we're also working on incorporating additional biomechanics tools like EMG and pressure sensors um, into our future work. Um, if you guys enjoyed this presentation, please check out, we have a poster that's um, very similar looking at IMU data quantifying skier performance um, and then a couple other things using SPM and IMUs and other applications. Um, thank you guys so much for your time um, and please reach out um, either on Slack or here if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So for those who just got here, um, we're going to move all the questions to after the first four talks. Um, so the next talk is by uh, Meredith Wells on uh, the triple step in swing dance. I'm a graduate student at Georgia State University and I'll be presenting on the bomb mechanics of the triple step and recreational swing dancers. The bomb mechanics of several dances, such as ballet, have been examined in depth. However, despite its increasing popularity, the bomb mechanical understanding of swing dancing remains limited. This study analyzed the kinetics of the triple step, which is a common step in swing dancing. It involves the dancer stepping to the side with one foot, bringing the second foot to meet the first with a slight hop, and then taking a third step to the side with the first foot. The triple step can be practiced with or without a partner. We chose to analyze both the differences between performing the triple step with and without a partner, as well as the differences among the three steps in each of the four conditions. Two directions, to the right and to the left, with and without a partner. We hypothesized that there would be differences between partnered and individual dance conditions, and that the third step of the triple step movement would exhibit the greatest risk for injury, specifically the greatest kinetic forces. In this study, eight recreational swing dancers, four men and four women, with an average of four years of dance experience, performed triple steps to both the right and the left with and without a partner. 20 reflected markers placed on anatomical landmarks following a modified plug and gate model, an eight camera motion capture system, and two AMTI force plates were used to collect the kinematic and kinetic data. The images shown here illustrate one of our participants triple stepping to the left. The green is the left leg and the red is the right leg. Image one shows the first step. Image two shows the flight phase. Image three is the second step. And image four is the third step. Contrary to our hypotheses, there were no significant differences in the ground reaction force, loading rate, or ankle power between dancing with and without a partner. This could be due to the experience level of our dancers. It is possible that a less experienced group would exhibit differences when dancing alone compared to having to lead or follow with a partner. Results further indicated that of the three steps, the third step exhibited a significantly lower ground reaction force and loading rate than the first two steps. And this can be seen in the image on the left. The top row is the first two steps and the bottom row is the third step. Additionally, the first step illustrated the greatest angle power propulsion, and the second step showed the greatest angle power absorption. And this can be seen in the figures on the right. The double asterisks indicate results were significant at a 0 0.01 level, and the triple asterisks indicate that the results were significant at a 0 0.001 level. TSL stands for triple step to the left, and TSLP is triple step to the left with a partner, while TSR and TSRP are triple step to the right and triple step to the right with a partner. These findings are likely due to the nature of the triple step because there's often a small flight phase that occurs between the first and second steps. Increased propulsion from the first step would be needed to create the flight phase, and the increased absorption would be the result of landing from a hop rather than from a step during the second. In addition, the dancers were asked to stop moving after they completed the third step to the side, 
which could be the reason for the lower ground reaction force and loading rate, as well as the decreased ankle power absorption and propulsion that we're seeing. If the dancers were to continue moving after the third step was taken, it would actually be the initiation of the next dance element. This information is important because it adds to our limited knowledge of this fun and social dance, which may help coaches and dancers improve performance as well as prevent injuries. This study is also, to the best of our knowledge, the first study to look at the kinetics of swing dancing, making it possible that this study will aid in the design of future studies. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to present live today, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the email address listed below. Thank you. All right, great. Um, that was another great talk recorded this time, so that's also an option. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to go straight to the next talk where uh, Joe Bassafume is going to be talking about uh, breathing during treadmill running and feedback on that. All right, well, thank you all very much for attending this virtual presentation. The title of the study that we carried out was The Influence of Receiving Real-Time Visual Feedback on Breathing During Treadmill Running to Exhaustion. I'm Joe Passifumi, and my co-authors on this work were Nelson Glover and Ajit Chowdhury from Ohio State, and Ann Cresselius from the University of Dayton. So to jump right into it, what exactly is, is efficient breathing? This is having your chest and abdomen expand and contract in synchrony, as you can see in the animation to the right there. This will maximize the amount of oxygen that we're able to get into our bloodstream with each breath. And combining with that, we know that our exercising muscles have an approximate six-fold increase in oxygen demand. So this efficient breathing has been proven and quantified using respiratory inductance plethysmography, or RIP for short. This is a non-invasive method of monitoring your breathing through belts around your chest and abdomen, as you can see in the picture there. A change in circumference of these belts will lead to a change in the voltage output which will ultimately, ultimately allow us to calculate phase angle to determine the synchrony between the two of them. These will range from zero to 180 degrees, with zero degrees being perfectly synchronous breathing. So to combine all of that, the purpose of this study was to examine if time to exhaustion could be increased if visual feedback on the chest and abdomen were provided during an exhaustive run. With our hypothesis being that having this visual feedback would improve your breathing efficiency and in turn lead to increasing your time to exhaustion. So the population that we carried this study out on were 13 recreational runners, eight females and five males. And on average, they ran five to 20 miles per week. An overview of their testing days, there were two separate days of testing that were separated by at least one week. They ran a five minute warm up on the treadmill and then they ran through a treadmill fatigue protocol to voluntary exhaustion. On both of these days, they were provided with breathing instructions and on one of these days, they were provided with visual feedback. This visual feedback that I keep mentioning can be seen here. So each of those rip belts that we saw before independently controls one of these animations. The chest controls the umbrella and the abdomen controls the rows. And these would update in real time on a monitor that was mounted to the front of the treadmill. So the runs to exhaustion themselves were based on another study. It involved the treadmill being at a fixed incline of three degrees and a starting speed of about five miles per hour. And every minute that speed would slightly increase until the runner reached their exhaustion point. The data that we collected, there was breathing data collected at 250 Hertz during the warm up and runs to exhaustion. And time to exhaustion was defined as from the treadmill start to the treadmill stop. The statistics that we ran, there were Pearson correlation coefficients for multiple variables that we'll get into. And we also ran some single variable regressions for our dependent variables of time to exhaustion and phase angle. So getting to the results now, starting with phase angle, as you can see, there were slight improvements made uh, with just having no visual feedback and then having visual feedback provided to you, ultimately averaging out to about 20 degrees and phase angle was not significantly predicted by having this visual feedback provided. If you take a look at time to exhaustion here, as you can see, there is virtually no difference between the two with both days just coming, coming in just under 10 minutes of time to exhaustion. So time to exhaustion was not significantly predicted by phase angle, and it was not significantly predicted by visual feedback. So this plot here just kind of expands those bar graphs that we were just looking at. This is the data for all 13 participants that we had, taking their visual feedback day and subtracting their no visual feedback day from that. 
And for discussion's sake, we're just going to focus on the left-hand side here, which is the six participants that improved their phase angle when they had visual feedback provided. So for these six participants, their average phase angle improvement jumps up to seven and a half degrees. And on average, they increased their time to exhaustion by 0.96%. And then you may have noticed here, there are four participants that are kind of head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of their phase angle improvement. Their average phase angle improvement was 11 degrees. And on average, they increased their time to exhaustion by 2.11%. So some discussion in future work. Analysis of those subroutes we just looked at does suggest that improving phase angle could lead to an increase in time to exhaustion. However, we did not observe this across our entire population. We think that this was primarily due to a lack of familiarization with the visual feedback and the breathing method, which ultimately contributed to little to no breathing improvement. Any future work should allow participants to be exposed to the visual feedback and breathing techniques prior to running. This can be done through direct teaching methods or just allowing a familiarization session for the participant so that they can be more comfortable with the breathing method and or any visual feedback that's given. So quick acknowledgements, thank you to the lab I was in in grad school, the Clinical Functional and Performance Biomechanics Lab. Thank you to Maggie Meglin and the Heat from Ohio State and Bernard Tarver from Great Lakes Neurotechnologies. Thank you all. Thank you, Joe. So just a reminder to everybody how we do this. We're gonna have about five to 10 minutes after the next talk to ask questions to both uh, Sarah, Meredith isn't here, and Joe, and then the next speaker. Um, so in the meantime, you can type all those questions in the chat function here, um, or you can also start typing questions in Slack, which we won't necessarily discuss in, in this session. Um, so getting ready for the next talk, probably my favorite talk of this session, but that might be a conflict of interest. Um, next up is uh, Justin Ortega, who's gonna be talking about metabolic rate for running in uh, Vaporfly shoes. Okay, sorry about that. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Justin and let's get this presentation running. So recently long distance running has been dominated by the Nike Vaporfly issue. For example, seven of the major marathons, of the seven major marathons, 17 of the 21 podium finishes for the women were completed with the shoe. The Vaporfly has been found to improve metabolic power by about 4% on average, but what exactly makes these shoes so super? To find out, let's look, in, look into its magical midsole. So first, the midsole is composed of Zumex foam, which is both compliant and resilient, while also being lightweight. Then embedded in the foam, there's a full-length carbon fiber plate, which increases the longitudinal bending stiffness of the shoe. And unique about the plate is its exaggerated curve. Together, these features contribute to the 4% improvements with the Vaporfly, but the relative contributions are unknown. For many people, they have never seen a carbon fiber plate in a running shoe before. So that feature was quickly identified as the culprit of the Vaporfly's overwhelming success. And with the mechanism of the carbon fiber plate not fully understood, many people questioned the validity of the shoe. Nevertheless, the Vaporfly was deemed acceptable for competition when World Athletics amended the rules, uh, limiting shoes to only, quote, one rigid plate or blade made from carbon fiber. But how much does a carbon fiber plate actually contribute to the 4% improvements of the Vaporfly? Given the controversy surrounding the carbon fiber plate, we were interested to see how running performance in the Vaporfly would be affected by reducing its longitudinal bending stiffness. So based on previous research done with carbon fiber plates and footwear and their effects on running performance, we hypothesized that reducing the longitudinal bending stiffness of the Vaporfly would increase the metabolic power of running by about 2%. In other words, by reducing the effects of the carbon fiber plate, we thought that the Vaporfly 4% would become the Vaporfly 2%. To test our hypothesis, we use cutting edge technology, literally. Since it wasn't feasible to take the shoe apart, remove the carbon fiber plate, and then put it back together, instead, we used the tabletop to cut into the midsole 
and through the plate to reduce the bending stiffness of the tree. Doing so, we successfully reduced the bending stiffness with the unaltered vapor fly from 26.5 newton meters per radian to 7.05 newton meters per radian, about four times less stiff. Then we had 10 recreational runners run in these two shoe conditions. While running, subjects were blinded to the footwear and we measured their metabolic rate with a parvo metabolic part. Okay, so that's what we did, but what did we find? Will the effects of the carbon fiber plate be minimal, modest, or super? Let's see what we found. So with the unaltered vapor fly, the average metabolic rate we found was about 13.91 watts per kilogram. And we hypothesized that the carbon fiber plate would have a modest effect on running performance. So we expected the metabolic rate with a cut vapor fly to be about 14.2 watts per kilogram. But, but what we actually found was that the average metabolic rate was only 13.98 watts per kilogram with the cut vapor fly. So we did find an increase in metabolic power with a, the with a cut vapor fly, but this difference was not statistically significant. And on average, there was only about half a percent difference between the two shoe conditions. So based on our results, reducing the bending st stiffness of the Vaporfly 4% did not make them into the Vaporfly 2%. In other words, the effects of the carbon fiber plate were not as substantial as we thought, and without the plate, the Vaporfly 4% becomes the Vaporfly 3.5%. In conclusion, our data suggests that the effect of the carbon fiber plate on the metabolic power of running is minimal, and there is a need to investigate how the other properties of the vapor fly contribute to its 4% metabolic saving. For more about the biomechanics of this topic, check out Laura's talk. And finally, we would like to thank Sam Carey, our handyman, for helping with our cutting edge technology, and Sam Zeff for helping with our bending stiffness testing. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Justin. Um, so, we only got three minutes left, but um, we're gonna take a couple more minutes. Um, so we wrapped up the first four talks in this session, and now we got, let's say about five to seven minutes of questions about these. Um, we have been getting a lot more questions in the chat. I think Shernice has been organizing some of them. Uh, yes, maybe you can start asking some questions. Okie dokie. Um, we have a lot of questions for Joseph. Is Joseph available for live questions? I'm here, yeah. All right, so we have one from Shalaya Kip that says, does breathing really limit time to exhaustion or VO2 max? And could your visual feedback be more useful for sub-max exercise? Well, to answer the first part, I think does breathing really limit time to exhaustion or VO2 max? I think that was kind of the purpose of the study to kind of see if it did because we didn't have any idea if something as simple as your breathing and proving that could increase your time to exhaustion. Um, I think to answer that first question, there's um, obviously there was no conclusive evidence of that, but we did see in subgroups that people were able to increase their time to exhaustion with visual feedback um, in terms of sub maximal exercise. Again, there's really not a lot on breathing efficiency and exercise. So it is possible that doing something sub-maximal not going to your max could, I guess, maybe help you feel better or in, you could go longer in terms of time to exhaustion, so. Got it. Um, I have a question for Sarah um, from Ying. Um, she says that there seems to be several factors that could influence lower limb kinematics, such as speed, tightness of boots, personal style, etc. How do you control for these factors? And do you give any additional instru instructions to skiers before data collection? That's a great question. Um, we did look at speed um, and we actually saw very little difference in the amount of uh, time it took for each skier to complete the course. So we didn't feel that we needed to normalize for that any further. Um, we had participants ski in their own ski boots uh, the way that they would normally have them buckled because we felt that this most accurately represents the conditions in which they would get injured. Um, but we did provide rental skis to standardize the turn radius and whatnot. Um, personal style is something that we do think may have a lot to do with injury risk. Um, you can't change how someone skis um, and then still accurately measure um, things such as injury risk down the road. 
Um, and so that's part of what we're looking for is difference in ski style. Um, it's obviously a very challenging environment, um, so many variables to control for. Um, and we're, we're just trying to keep all of that in mind as we move forward. Um, as far as additional instructions to the skiers, they did get two practice runs through the course beforehand. Um, we asked them to try to ski it as uh, similarly as possible, run to run, um, try to keep a consistent speed. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Got a question for Justin from Robin. Um, the question is, have you considered the shape of the carbon fiber plates in addition to the location of the cut? Yep, so for the location of the cuts, we like initial thoughts about the plate were that it would save energy at the MCP joint. So that's why we only made the cuts at the forefoot, but it is possible that the effects of the plate still contribute like through the heel, like during impact. So there, there might still be residual effects from the stiffness there. And shape, regarding the shape, for so I think that you mean by that by the curvature. So uh, actually, Farina at, at all 2019, I think they looked at that, like different curvatures, and that affects the mechanical demand at the ankle. So the, the thing that's um, different about the Nike shoe that the curve is like very exaggerated. So the, what Farina did find was that the more, more extreme curvature did contribute to less mechanical work by the ankle. So um, then the, the, I think that's what you mean by the shape and the location. Okay, thank you. So just, um, in the interest of time, we, we got a lot of questions in the chat, which is great, which, that's where we want them. So right after the session, those gonna go all to Slack. So I encourage all the presenters to answer some of these questions uh, on Slack or even in this chat while we're still live for the next hour. Um, so I think um, we should start moving on to the next round. Um, this is just how we do these virtual conferences. Um, so keep checking in on the Slack where we can have discussions. Feel free to message the speakers to go more into detail, set up meetings in the spatial room to discuss face-to-face -face, um, some of the aspects of the studies. Um, so yeah, let, let's get on to the next session, Cernese. All right, so we're moving into the lower limb mechanics section and our first speaker is Eric Honert from the University of Calgary and the presentation is on foot and ankle kinetics during a long duration run. We have a pre-recorded video for that, so let's watch it. My talk today will be over ankle and foot biomechanics throughout a long run. During running, over 50% of the positive and negative joint work are contributed by the ankle and foot. During long distance running, the positive ankle work has been shown to decrease, which is thought to be a detriment to running performance. However, this has been observed during a constant speed run that does not reflect running outside of a laboratory setting, which is filled with running speed changes. Furthermore, we do not know how foot kinetics change throughout a long duration run. Understanding such changes can provide further insights into long distance running performance and allow researchers to optimize shoes which directly interface with the human foot. The footwork may change throughout a run as foot contact patterns change when the tibialis anterior, or TA, fatigues during a long duration run. Changing a foot contact pattern may influence the amount of absorption from the foot and shoe, thus changing the amount of negative footwork. The TA fatigue can be observed as an increase in the EMG intensity and a decrease in the overall EMG frequency. In total, the purpose of our study was to understand changes in ankle work, footwork, and tibialis anterior EMG throughout a varying speed run. As such, we had 14 heel striking runners run for 58 minutes. We examined the ankle work, footwork, and TA EMG intensity and frequency. The footwork we quantified here has been referred to as the distal hind foot or distal rear foot work, which is an estimate 
of all the contributions within the foot. The protocol started with a five minute warm up, followed by a varying speed run. Subjects ran at 2.8 meters per second four times throughout the run as indicated by C1, C2, C3, and C4. The subjects also ran at 90%, 100%, and 110% of their 10K speed throughout the run. These three speeds were randomized for each participant in each of the running bouts indicated in the green boxes. To start with, here is the ankle power across the stance phase of running at 2.8 meters per second. Darker colors indicate that more time has progressed in the run. We see that the ankle positive work decreased throughout the run at this speed and the other three speeds as well. This is a similar trend to that observed at a constant speed run. Next, we have the foot power across the stance phase of running at 2.8 meters per second. Surprisingly, we saw that the positive footwork increased throughout the run at all running velocities. This can be attributed to an increase in the work performed by the intrinsic foot muscles. We also observed that at the fastest running velocity, 110% of the 10K velocity, the amount of negative footwork decreased. Such a decrease may be attributed to less absorption by the foot soft tissues and the shoe cushioning. Last, we have the tibialis anterior activation. Here I have split the activation into a low frequency intensity from 21 to 34 hertz and a high frequency intensity between 46 and 435 hertz. The intensity shown is from 50% of stance time before foot contact to toe off. We observed a shift in the activation frequency as the run progressed as the relative contribution of the low frequency activation increased after foot contact. This difference was significant at 110% of the 10K velocity, which may indicate that the TA plays a role in the negative footwork. We did not observe any significant changes in the overall TA intensity, which would be the summation of both of these graphs. As such, we cannot confirm fatiguing running findings during our changing speed run. In total, we saw a decrease in the ankle positive work and the TA activation frequency shifted lower at the fastest running speed. We also observed a decrease in the negative footwork at the fastest running speed and an increase in the positive footwork at all speeds. It is not known how this increase in positive work affects running economy, but running shoes with carbon fiber plates can mitigate the positive work by the foot, which may be a contributing factor for their performance. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. We will move straight into the second speaker, which is Torsten Dahlin from the University of Alberta. And he'll be talking about the role of toe flexors in opposing foot arch deformation. All right, uh, thank you, Shirley, for that introduction. I'm uh, gonna jump right into it here. So one of the questions that I have been pondering during my PhD is why do humans still have such well-developed toe flexor muscles? Because after all, we haven't really had the need to grasp anything with our toes since we went from being arboreal climbers to becoming terrestrial runners. And one of the leading hypotheses is that the toe flexor muscles have evolved in to regulate foot arch stiffness uh, and prevent excessive arch deformation during running. Um, that hypothesis has received quite considerable research attention, but it's still unclear whether these muscles can actually generate a, a substantial net joint moment at the midfoot and enough to actually contribute to stiffening the arch. So the purpose of the study that I'm presenting on today was to investigate the role of the toe flexor muscles in preventing excessive foot arch, arch deformation during uh, different loading tasks. So we devised a repeated measures experiment where we had participants seated with their hips and knees flexed to approximately 90 degrees. We placed uh, an external load on top of their distal thigh and they had their forefoot resting on a force platform that was elevated from the ground and then they had their heel uh, basically uh, suspended above the floor behind the force platform. And this 
allowed us to create a loading condition where we had external loads deforming the foot uh, from the ground reaction cores as well as the weight placed on top of the thigh, as well as the ankle planner flexors acting on the foot, uh, which would create a deforming load. As we encourage the uh, participants to try to maintain their foot parallel to the ground. Uh, while seated in this position and recorded with a motion analysis system, we had the participants loaded with four different loads in two different conditions. The first condition uh, was simply for the participants to sit with their toe flexors as relaxed as possible. And the second condition was uh, the participants performing a maximal voluntary toe flexor action uh, where they pressed their toes as hard as they could against the force plant. Uh, we did find a significant uh, a load by condition effect for midfoot angle, and I demonstrated that uh, we do get greater arch depression when we increase the external load that is acting on the foot uh, in um, the relaxed toe flexor condition versus toe flexor MVC condition. Uh, in addition to that, we saw that the net joint moment acting at the midfoot was larger consistently in the toe flexor MVC condition, uh, where the moment tended to elevate the foot arch. Uh, also, not surprisingly, the midfoot net joint moment did increase with increasing external load. So what can we take away from this? Uh, first of all, it does seem that the toe flexor muscles can contribute to the midfoot moment and to stiffening the foot arches. However, it is still unclear which of the toe flexor muscles are more important in contributing to this role. And it's also unclear whether these muscles were highly active during our uh, relaxed condition. So I'm currently working on developing a musculoskeletal model that will investigate or estimate the muscle contribution during uh, these different tasks. The other thing that uh, might be worthwhile to notice was that the difference in midfoot net joint moment between the MVC condition and the toe flexor relaxed condition was relatively small. We're talking about roughly five to 10 newtons or something like 10% at most. Uh, so that's a relatively small difference, of course. So the question then remains, from an evolutionary perspective, would such a small contribution from the toe flexors to the midfoot moment provide a sufficient uh, selection pressure for this characteristic to be something that has been selected for, or may the toe flexor muscles have evolved to serve some other type of function? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tristine. And as a reminder to everyone, please keep the questions coming in the chat. We'll be able to address some of those at the end of this block. We're doing pretty good on time. So we're gonna keep rolling and have our next speaker, which is Matthew Payne from Loughborough University. And his presentation is on energy dissipation within the thigh during forefoot, rear foot, and rear foot impacts at different running velocities. And we have a pre-recorded video, so let's give our attention to that. Hi, I'm Matt Payne, and I'm here to talk about energy dissipation due to soft tissue movement of the thigh during running, or in the words of the great philosopher, Bender B. Rodriguez, you meet bags of losers. Soft tissue motion, normally a problem, but it's also a real mechanical thing. So we're going to try and measure how much energy loss might come about due to soft tissue motion of the thigh when running. Seven mile subjects, different speeds on a treadmill, forefoot and rear foot conditions, lots and lots of markers measured, 750 hertz, small markers, lots of time to set up, lots of time to analyse and lots of students' eyeballs strained while doing stuff in BICOM. Just a quick indication of how much marker movement there is. The red vectors are the movement between a fixed solidified set of marker positions taken from a static and these are during an actual running trial. The blue line is the effective rigid body marker between the joint centres. 
because we were looking at impacts, we've low pass filtered at 100 hertz, which does have issues for analysing things later on, but I'll speak about that later. In order to get some sort of mechanical measurements of the soft tissue that we can then work with, use the 3D Delaunay triangulation method, gives you individual tetrahedrons. Here we can see them deforming, shows what's happening on the thigh. We use Tonon method to sum these up to then get per frame a Delaunay triangulation rigid body from the array, which means that frame to frame we have inertia tensor centre of mass, 3D orientation, and this we compare to what we'd get from our rigid body joint centre related information. So that's what we did. Because of the potential issues with different things, the high frequency filtering, um, we did try different ways of analysing the data. Currently we're working with using a damped harmonic oscillator. We do it separately for linear and rotational components because it's generally sensitive to filtering and marker noise. However, it does not do such a good job of finding some of the local deformation energy, which needs something else additional doing to it. And that is why when we've gone back and done this again, the numbers, the peak numbers here, the high numbers here are not as high as in the abstract. But what we do see is between foot conditions and running conditions, we get changes in, we get differences in energy loss between conditions and the speeds, as we might expect in a sensible manner. Using the normalised energy to segment mass calculated, as can be seen here, we do get some significant differences between conditions, which is nice because it shows it's got, and hopefully it's, it's robust enough to discriminate between things in a meaningful way. Also helps us give some idea that maybe we're getting sort of valid numbers out for this component of what we're measuring at least. You can see we don't get the full thigh mass measured in this way. There's limitations on how much the thigh we can cover with the markers and therefore calculate. Memes 5.1 for this mass of people, you'd normally expect something of just over seven as a mean. So we are getting most of the majority of the mass. And that brings us down to a bit of limitations and implications. How much thigh mass should be included in regards to how much soft tissue motion is involved anyway is problematic. We've got 68% of the whole thigh mass here. It could be that not all the thigh mass is involved in the oscillation. We know that the bone is the rigid part. It's going to have been included to some point under those markers. So there's still debate as to how much soft tissue motion represented by surface markers is occurring over the whole tissue. However, in terms of choosing a different amount of thigh mass, it should hopefully only produce a systematic error patterns of result should be unchanged. So the two important things are this energy loss is unaccounted for in typical analyses. It's measurable, it's quantifiable, it could be seen as meaningful. It's also likely that it's, it's, un it's unlikely to be mechanically reusable. It's passive oscillation, it's moving around. It certainly probably isn't usable gate to gate, stride to stride. And then some things I've mentioned, not all localised deformation was included. That has turned out to be more of an issue with the thigh than when we previously looked at the shank. There's clearly more localised deformation going on in the thigh than the shank, and so the next thing we need to do is find ways to quantify this while keeping our high frequency data involved and getting robust numbers out at the end that we hope are not sensitive to various processing. All right, thank you, Matthew. And jumping into our final speaker, who is Mar Micah Garcia from the University of Toledo. And the presentation is on running symmetry, running symmetries within yields of different muscular symmetries. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. I'd first like to start by thanking ASB for the opportunity to present today, as well as to acknowledge my co-authors. Unimpaired gait is often assumed to be symmetrical, while asymmetries are thought to contribute to the risk of sustaining a running-related injury. However, some magnitude of asymmetry is normal, as youth long-distance runners have demonstrated side-to-side -side differences in lower extremity kinematics during running. If we take a look at results from a recent study in youth runners, on the x-axis you're going to have the symmetry, with zero being low and one being high, and then on the y-axis you're going to have the number of participants. So if we take a look at the figure on the left, this is going to be sagittal plane knee motion, 
and you see that the vast majority of these youth runners demonstrate high symmetry in that sagittal plane motion. However, when you look at the middle and the right figures, which correspond to frontal plane knee and transverse plane hip motion, we see there's much more variability in these symmetry measures among these youth runners. Now, the exact cause of these asymmetries is not known, but it's thought that muscle function may be a contributing factor. In a study in youth athletes who underwent ACL reconstruction, it was found that those participants with higher lower extremity strength asymmetries demonstrated greater biomechanical asymmetries during a single leg landing task. And furthermore, these, un or these ACL patients demonstrated greater asymmetries than uninjured youth athletes. These results therefore suggest that muscle function symmetry may contribute to biomechanical symmetry. However, this hasn't been studied in youth runners. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to investigate if youth runners with higher muscle function symmetry demonstrate higher frontal and transverse plane running kinematic symmetry than those with lower muscle function symmetry. So we had 135 uninjured youth runners participate in the study and all participants underwent muscle function testing that included a side plank endurance hold, isometric hip abduction strength, and isokinetic hip extension strength testing. And this was all done bilaterally. Participants also underwent a three-dimensional running analysis where they ran at a self-selected speed over a non-instrumented treadmill while 3D kinematics were collected. For our analysis, in order to quantify the muscle function symmetry, we used the normalized symmetry index where 100% equals perfect symmetry and 0% equals perfect asymmetry. And then for our kinematic symmetry, since we were concerned with the entire waveform throughout the gait cycle, we used the linear fit model, which represents an R-squared value where one is perfect symmetry and zero is perfect asymmetry. For each of those three muscle function tests then, we stratify participants, participants into tercials of the either low, moderate, or high muscle function symmetry. And so the 45 participants with the lowest symmetry were in that low group, 45 with the middle were in the moderate, and then the 45 with the highest muscle function were in the high symmetry group. And then we did that for each of those muscle tests independently and compared frontal and transverse playing symmetry among those groups. So for our results, we didn't find any significant differences in running symmetries among the low, moderate, or high muscle function symmetry groups for any of those three tests, so side plank, hip abduction strength, or hip extension strength. I do want to show you a few results um, that are measures that are often reported in the literature. So first off, in a study with the runners, it was found that those runners with higher hip extension strength demonstrate less hip rotation range of motion. However, if you look at our hip rotation symmetry among the three hip extension strength groups here, you see there's no difference in the, in the average hip rotation symmetry. And you'll also see that there's still very high uh, variability in these symmetry measures among the three strength groups. Similarly, hip abduction strength is related to hip adduction motion. But again, if we look at the hip adduction symmetry, it's not different among those um, hip abduction strength groups. So frontal and transverse plane kinematic running symmetry was not different across the varying levels of mus muscle function symmetry for the side plank endurance test, isometric hip abduction, or isokinetic hip extension testing. Something to consider though is that muscle function symmetry measures fail to account for any potential musculature weaknesses that these runners may have, since it only quantifies side-to-side -side differences in, in their uh, functional ability. So while frontal and transverse plane running kinematic symmetries do not appear to contribute to kinematic asymmetries in these runners, future work is necessary in order to investigate some other variables that may contribute to kinematic asymmetries and then ultimately to the risk of sustaining a running related injury. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Micah. All right, we have about seven minutes for questions and answers. Um, so I'll pass it on to Laura, who's been monitoring the questions for this block. So thanks everyone, we have some interesting questions. If you have any more, um, feel free to keep typing them in the chat and we'll get them in the seven minutes. Um, so the first question is for Matthew from Eric and he said, do you think that the soft tissue absorptions are beneficial or deterious to running economy? Thanks. Well, I would say that they're probably deleterious to run an economy. It's rather annoying. We had a big study set up this summer with about three MSc students and multiple other people to do a running economy study because we've had some other outputs from the biomechanics lab showing relationships between running economy and inertia. Well, perimeter widths, actually, not even inertia, but perimeter widths 
which could relate to the uh, soft tissue amount that there is on a person. And these, there is a slight interaction effect that the bigger the person is in terms of calf size, the greater the actual energy loss is per kilogram. Um, there, and then, sorry, slightly to add it as well, are these meaningful values? Yes, if you're looking at small changes in running economy and small percent, they're, they're in the percent changes or percent energy loss from stride to stride. So they are, they are equivalent to what people are trying to recover from other devices or looking between population groups. Perfect, thank you. Um, our next question is for Torstein and it's from Ryan and he says, do you think that the toe flexors could contribute to maintaining stability when walking on uneven terrain? Trying to think about your final question about selection pressure before roads slash sidewalks. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ryan, for that question. I think uh, you raise a very good point here. And I don't have the answer yet, but it is certainly something that we're investigating down the road. And the, the last study in my series of three for my PhD, we're trying to use the uh, uneven terrain uh, in a more standardized way, at least, uh, to try to strengthen the planar intrinsic muscles and see if, uh, if uh, that might have a good effect. So that might give us more answers in whether uneven terrain can have a positive effect on these muscles. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for Micah from Elena, and she asks, is there any correlation between strength and symmetry if you use continuous variables? Yeah, we, we asked that question as well, and when we looked at them, um, just looking at the correlations, we didn't find any, any strong or even moderate correlations between symmetry and strength, so that's why we ended up going ahead and, and trying to breaking them up into the tercile groups. Perfect. Our next question is for Matt again from Ajit. And they said, I'm wondering if you can put the amount of energy loss into context. Is four joules per kilogram a meaningful amount? So, yeah, I think um, it depends what you think is a meaningful amount. If you're looking at energy losses as an elite runner, then yes, this is definitely meaningful in terms of percentage differences. If you're maybe interested in just general population level, may, maybe it isn't. But it does start to add up between the shank and the thigh. If you start getting up into tens of joules being lost per cycle, you're starting to get comparatively meaningful energy losses that, if it's completely dissipated, can't be returned in any way. It's effectively a breaking force on the centre of mass motion of the body, then it has to be returned each time, so it starts to add up. Perfect, thank you. Um, and our next question is for Eric from Shernice, and she asks, how do you randomly, how did you randomly vary speed to simulate what would happen in a 10K? Did you use any sort of algorithm to predict speed changes? So thank you for the question. Uh, we kind of pilot tested around, we went, you know, maybe 80% below your 10K speed and 120% above your 10K speed, and that was exhausting the subjects way too fast. Um, so it was a little bit a guess and check aspect of it. Obviously, this is not exactly what's going to happen in a 10K. Um, I mean, there's also you know uh, hills and things like that, but this is at least to start to get an understanding of what's happening during these longer runs that you don't just have a constant speed. We have time for one more question, Laura. Okay, great. The last one um, seems to be a follow-up on Ryan's last question for Torstein. And, um, so Matt asks, Ryan, cool question. I wonder if Torstein's metrics might be different for individuals who spend a substantial amount of time trail running. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, and uh, we sort of touched on this when I, when I answered Ryan's question, but uh, we do believe that uh, these muscles might be important in adapting to different terrain. And uh, if we're correct in that hypothesis, we would certainly expect people who are trained trail runners to potentially have stronger toe flexor muscles, for example, or uh, yeah, better, better developed toe flexor muscles than people who are sedentary. Great, thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to move on to the final four presentations, which are on vending specific prosthesis. And up first, we have Kara Ashcroft from the University of Colorado, um, otherwise known as the noisy hopper number one from the keynote yesterday. And she'll be talking about the effects of the takeoff board stiffness on long jump performance. All right, guys, thanks for being here. Um, so the square long jump includes a jump for distance that's preceded by a run up sprint. And athletes, where I want to go. Sorry. And athletes maximize their jump distance by maximizing their horizontal run up velocity while limiting the horizontal velocity loss and maximizing the vertical velocity gains at takeoff. And runners with unilateral transtibial amputations compete in long jump using a running specific prosthesis or an RSP. And these RSPs are a passive elastic carbon fiber spring that acts in series with the residual limb attaching to it through a rigid socket. And this carbon fiber spring component, it, it comes in predetermined stiffness categories that are based on the manufacturer and prescribed to the athlete based on their body weight and allow the storage and release of elastic energy during ground contact. So in sprinting, it's well documented that RSPs limit the vertical ground reaction forces applied by athletes with transtibial amputations. In the sport of long jump, this limitation on force production likely limits the maximum velocity attained during their run up, as well as the amount of mechanical power that's produced to redirect their center of mass in an upward and forward direction at jump takeoff. So it's likely that, so in athletes with transtibial amputations, right, the performance measures um, of a takeoff are ideally generating a large vertical impulse that propels the athletes in a um, parabolic flight curve, while at the same time, max or minimizing, sorry, the vertical velocity or the horizontal um, impulse. So in athletes with transtibial amputations, it's likely that their long jump performance is based not only on their horizontal and vertical velocities, but also likely the in-series RSP stiffness. So to measure the effects of in-series stiffness on long jump performance, we measured the effects of takeoff platform stiffness on long jump distance in non-amputees. We then quantified the effects of RSP stiffness on run-up velocity, takeoff technique, and jump distance in athletes with the unilateral transtibial amputation. We then compared those performance measures between amputees and non-amputees. We hypothesized that regardless of run-up velocity, decreasing in-series surface stiffness at takeoff would result in longer jump distances in both our non-amputee and our amputee athletes. Um, and that would be um, by enhancing their takeoff technique, which, with, which specifically would mean that we would have greater vertical velocity gains and less horizontal velocity losses at those jump takeoffs. So we varied takeoff stiffness in our non-amputees by building a custom spring new platform that we installed between two force plates. And we varied the number of springs to create two compliant conditions in addition to the track surface. And in our amputees, we varied takeoff stiffness using the recommended RSP category, one category less stiff and one category more stiff. And what we found was that in our non-amputees, horizontal velocity loss increased from the spring platforms to the more stiff track surface. In our amputees, we see that when they jumped in one category stiffness, one category less stiff than recommended, the change in horizontal velocity was quite varied. But when they jumped in one category more stiff than recommended, there was a large increase in horizontal velocity loss. When we look at vertical velocity in our non-amputees, we see that there's a small, we see that there's a decrease in vertical velocity gain as platform stiffness increases from the pl spring platform to the track surface. And in our amputees, we see that A, they generated more vertical velocity than our non-amputees, 
But inversely, we see that as stiffness increases, their vertical velocity gains increase. And while the horizontal velocity loss and the vertical velocity gains were smaller than expected in our non-amputee subjects, they were adequate to account for a, a change in jump distance across stiffnesses, which we see here. But there's a significant decrease in stiffness from the 84 kilonewton per meter springboard platform to the 1,628 kilonewton per meter track surface. And in our amputees, we actually found no significant difference in jump distance across the stiffnesses. So again, we hypothesized that decreasing that takeoff stiffness would result in longer jump distances by increasing vertical velocity gain and decreasing horizontal velocity loss. And in our non-amputee athletes, we were able to sort of prove this correctly in that as athletes, as takeoff stiffness decreased, athletes were able to generate more vertical velocity gain while minimizing the horizontal velocity losses in amounts that were sufficient to produce a longer jump distance. And our amputee athletes were actually unable to conclude that decreasing that RSP stiffness would produce longer jump distances for them. So overall, we found that changing in series stiffness at takeoff did affect long jump performance, but it did so in different ways um, with athletes that were jumping with or without a transtibial amputation. So we're continuing to collect data on this to better um, evaluate the effect of RSP stiffness on, the, on long jump performance um, in athletes with unilateral transtibial amputations. And I would like to give a really quick shout out to the CU track and field team because these guys were so awesome to work with on this study, as well as all of my other athletes. So thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Ryan. Alcantara, who I'm told is the second noisy hopper from the keynote yesterday from the University of Colorado Boulder, and he'll be presenting on curve sprinting with a split toe running specific prosthesis. I believe this one is pre recorded. Hi, my name is Randall Cantra. I'm from the University of Colorado, and I'm going to talk to you today about curve sprinting with a split toe running specific prosthesis. I want to start off by thanking Philara Composites for partially funding the study and producing and providing the uh, prosthesis we tested. For track events longer than 100 meters, more than half the races run along the curve. And curve running velocity can be described as a function of runner's uh, mass M, curve radius R, and centripetal force production FC. And for an individual using a running specific prosthesis, centripetal force production on the curve can be challenging because the prosthesis is designed for linear running. It's very torsionally stiff in the frontal plane. But Philara Composites has produced a running specific prosthesis where the distal end is cut in the anterior posterior direction. So here we have an example of the kind of a cross section of that. Of the, of the distal end of the prosthesis where the distal parts, there's two of them now, can move somewhat independently. In theory, this increases uh, traction on the curve, which would affect centripetal force production and overall sprinting performance. And so we compared the sprint performance of using the split prosthesis to a traditional solid prosthesis of the same shape, material, stiffness, and mass. And we compare these two prostheses across two curve conditions, a curve with a radius of 17.2 meters and a curve with a radius of 36.5 uh, meters. And these represent uh, lane one of a 200 and 400 meter track, respectively. We used, uh, we used force plates to measure centripetal force um, and optical motion capture cameras to monitor running velocity, sprinting velocity. We hypothesize that the split prosthesis would increase sprint, perf uh, sprint performance velocity compared to the solid, and that it would increase centripetal force production compared to the solid prosthesis on the curve. We also we did compare these two prostheses on a straightaway. I'm not going to present those results, but essentially there was no difference in velocity or centripetal force on the straightaway between the two prostheses. Here are the curve uh, sprinting results on the y-axis is sprinting velocity and the x-axis um, is a comparison between the split and solid prostheses for each participant in this pilot study. The colors denote the two curve conditions um, that I described earlier. And what we see if we look just quickly is that there's an offset between the 17.2 meter curve times and or speeds and the 36.5 meter speeds. And overall we quantify this as a 0.31 meters per second 
decrease in sprinting velocity when on the smaller radius curve. And this agrees with prior, re prior research, which has found that as curve radius decreases, so does uh, maximal sprinting velocity. <clears throat> If we compare the two prostheses, overall the split prosthesis resulted in sprinting velocities that were 0.13 meters per second faster than the solid. Although if you look at the individual participants here, we see that there's a range of benefits uh, or varying degrees of benefits of the split prosthesis. And that leads me to the next um, point here, which is that there may be some interaction between curve radius and the velocity benefit that we observed in the split prosthesis. If you take subject three, for example, we see that the slope of the line representing the difference between the solid and split prosthesis um, sprinting velocities, the slope of the line for the blue 17.2 meter condition is steeper than for the 36.5 meter condition. So if we try to relate this back to a track and field event, someone uh, using the split prosthesis in lane one might see an increased benefit compared to someone using the split prosthesis in lane eight. If we look at centripetal force production, here we have on the y-axis stance average centripetal force. We see that the individuals that saw speed in, or velocity increases also saw centripetal force production increases. That would be subjects two and three primarily, with subject one not seeing an over, much of an overall change, similar to where, with their sprinting velocity um, results. Overall, the split toe prosthesis resulted in uh, maximal effort sprinting speeds that were 0.13 meters per second faster than the solid prosthesis. However, like I described earlier, there may be some interaction between curve radius and this um, velocity effect. <clears throat> if we try to extrapolate these, um, you know, maximal effort uh, velocity differences to a 400 meter race, the curves of a 400 meter race, we would save about a half a second over the course of a Paralympic 400 meter event. Um, this would be the difference in the 2016 Rio Olympics, at least, between a bronze and a gold medal. Um, but, our, but more work is needed to confirm the speed effect and identify other underlying mechanisms. Um, but there's an opportunity to test some very simple um, but potentially effective um, prosthesis designs um, that could improve sprinting performance overall. Great, thank you for that presentation, Ryan. We'll move along to our next presenter, um, which is Hiroto Murata from the Tokyo University of Science. And they will be presenting on external mechanical work during running after unilateral transfemoral amputation. Okay. So thank you for a kind introduction. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming today. The running specific prosthesis have enabled unilateral transfemoral amputees to run. However, bouncing a step during running is a highly demanding task in this population. Generally, okay. The bouncing steps during running are described by the mechanical energy of the body. The bounce is achieved by negative external work to absorb the energy after landing, and the positive external work to restore the energy before takeoff. In non is running, negative work is equal to positive work for each step. As a result, net external work is zero at each step. From a mechanical energy fluctuation, running can be modeled as a spring mass system. Many studies based on this model have done in non-pitties running. External mechanical work describes underlying mechanics for running. However, that of unilateral transfemoral amputees is largely unknown. My question is, how do they perform balancing steps using morphological asymmetric racks? So, the aim of this study was to analyze the mechanics of bouncing steps by evaluating the negative, positive, and the net external mechanical works of the intact and the prosthetic legs. In our experiments, eight runners with unilateral transfemoral amputation run the instrumented treadmill across six running speeds. The speed was increased from 30% to 80% by increments of 10% where the 100% was defined as the average velocity of 100 meter dash. And next, we measured the vertical and the anterior posterior ground reaction forces and calculated the mechanical energy in the sidecar plane. This video shows the time profile of mechanical energy fluctuation and running synchronized running motion. And as you can see, 
Runnow with running a specific prosthesis also performed the energy absorption and the restoration in both legs. As dependent variables, the negative, positive, and the net external works in both legs were determined. Here we can see the results in left side. X and Y axis indicate running speed and the mechanical work. And the field and the open symbols indicate intact and the prosthetic legs respectively. First, negative work in intact leg was larger than that in prosthetic leg. So, prosthetic leg has less capability to absorb the energy than intact leg. Second, positive work was almost similar between intact and the prosthetic legs. This probably because of energy storing and the return capabilities of carbon fiber thread. Finally, net external works were totally negative in intact leg, but positive in prosthetic leg across the range of running speeds. As a result, their periodic balances were achieved by deceleration in intact leg and acceleration in prosthetic leg at each step. In this case, the simple spring mass model could not be applied because the net external work is not zero for both legs. Therefore, mechanical energy fluctuations could reveal better biomechanical models to analyze unilateral transfemoral amputees. We observed external mechanical work during running was not the same for the both legs. In conclusion, Unilateral transfemoral amputees maintain their bouncing steps with a limb specific strategy during running. Therefore, the bilateral differences between lower limbs should be considered for analysis of running mechanics and the implementation of gait rehabilitation programs. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you for that presentation. And we'll move on to the final presentation of this session which is by Janet Zhang from the University of Colorado Boulder, who will be talking about transfemoral amputation using a prosthesis with and without a knee. Oops. Hello everyone, my name is Janet and I'm a postdoc in University of Colorado Boulder. So here's the topic that I'm gonna talk today so in this picture, it shows a runner with unilateral transfemoral amputation and he's running with a running specific prosthetic blade, which is widely used for its good performance in energy storage and return. Nowadays, different types of mechanical knees have been developed to replace the loss of biological function of the knee joint for people with transfemoral amputations. Compared to the prosthesis without the knee, the prosthesis with the knee was shown to reduce metabolic cost by around 20% during running, indicates its advantage in reducing metabolic cost. Kinetically, in a group of novice runners, prosthesis with the knee increased the hip sagittal plane range of motion and reduced the swing face hip abduction when compared to prosthesis without the knee. These kinematics changes indicate that the prosthesis with the knee could induce less asymmetrical running gait. However, it is not clear whether the added knee joint will add more mechanical energy loss during running compared to the prosthesis without the knee. Thus, in this study, we aim to assess, we aim to focus on the comparison of these two prosthesis designs from kinematics and energy return perspectives to assess which one will work better for a Paralympian athlete. We hypothesize that uh, the we hypothesize that the prosthesis with the knee would induce similar hip kinematics changes in the Paralympian athletes as found in novice runners, including a higher sagittal plane hip range of motion and a lower peak hip abduction in swing phase in the affected leg. We also hypothesize that the energy return performance would be comparable between these two prosthesis designs. We asked a female Paralympian level triathlete with unilateral transfemoral amputation to run at four speed. We tested the slowest running speed first, which is her racing speed. We collected kinematics and ground reaction force data for 30 seconds at each speed level. And we ended at four meters per second speed, which is her uh, fastest speed. In the no knee condition, the prosthesis used in the running 
in the, uh, the process used in the testing is uh, running specific prosthetic blade manufactured with five filawa composites. In the knee condition, the prosthesis used is a mechanical knee joint combined with running specific prosthesis manufactured by Autopark. Now let's take a look at the result. These two figures show that the affected leg hip joint movement in the sagittal and the frontal planes at the slowest running speed. We calculated hip sagittal plane range of motion and hip swing phase peak abduction, which is an active value shown here on the right side of the figure for all testing speed from both sides of the legs. The circles represent the affected leg and the solid dots represent the unaffected leg. We found up to five degree increase in hip range of motion in the knee condition than the no knee condition, which is smaller than the previously reported value. Meanwhile, we, find, we found up to 26 degree of reduction in hip peak abduction in the affected leg, which is higher than the previously reported value. Moreover, the peak hip abduction angle is more comparable between affected and unaffected legs, indicating a less asymmetrical gait in the knee condition than the no knee condition. Another focus of our study is the mechanical energy loss of the two prosthesis designs. We generated a work loop by plotting vertical ground reaction force versus leg length shortening during stance phase. We further calculate the hysteresis value, which is the area in the loop. The hysteresis value indicates the mechanical energy loss during running. In most of the testing speeds, the hysteresis values were comparable between the two testing processes, indicating a comparable mechanical energy return performance. However, in the fastest testing speed, the hysteresis value reduced in the affected leg and increased in the unaffected leg in the knee condition compared to the no knee condition. Since we did not randomize our testing sequence in this study, whether this change is due to fatigue or due to prosthesis design is unclear. The result of our study indicate that the prosthesis with a mechanical knee joint would induce better biomechanical changes, including an increased hip sagittal plane range of motion and a reduced hip abduction. In the meantime, the added knee joint did not induce higher mechanical energy loss. The single participant pilot study indicates the importance of future research to determine the effect of a prosthesis with and without the knee during running in individuals with unilateral transfemural amputations. We will hypothesize that this change in prosthesis design would induce better running biomechanics, including less asymmetrical gait during running, which will improve the running experience for individuals with unilateral transfemural amputations in the future. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, for a great last uh, mini session within our session. I think Woder will um, kick it off with some questions. Yeah, we, we have been getting a lot of questions for uh, Kara and, and Ryan, and not that many yet on the uh, transfibular amputation. So let's get them going, too. So just start it off for uh, Kara. Um, Casey uh, is wondering about um, whether you evaluated the incoming velocity at the board and whether those were diff uh, consistent within participants uh, across conditions? Yes, yeah, so takeoff velocities um, were different, but that's kind of why we more focused on the actual change in vertical and horizontal velocities um, rather than actual um, values of vertical and horizontal velocities um, and sort of to kind of like normalize that takeoff velocity because they did vary like quite a bit, so. So you see differences in takeoff velocity and differences in incoming velocity, but you focused on sort of the normalized chains. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And another question for you, um, which probably is quickly to answer, is that um, Stephanie was wondering whether you think the findings would be um, more similar between groups if you had changed one side of the platform only, um, the stiffness of one side of the platform only. Yeah, I don't know that that um, would make a difference because the takeoff for the um, long jump is just off of one leg anyway. Um, so sort of by design, that sport is unilateral um, at takeoff. Um, and, that, and the platform was only at the takeoff, right? The, the runway correct. was the same. Correct. The platform was only at the takeoff. That's the only time they came in contact with that platform. 
All right. Um, before we move on to uh, Ryan, um, another question for you is whether you have evaluated the effect of uh, traction shear forces on long jump performance. Yeah, and you know we haven't so far. Um, we have only focused on the horizontal and vertical velocity changes um, because that's sort of what's been looked at in previous literature in terms of defining what creates a successful successful jump distance. So. All right. Um, so still not a lot of questions about the transfemoral amputations. Um, so we're going to give it the floor to Ryan to answer some of the questions that he got. Um, and one of those questions is um, from uh, Eric um, that just gave a talk as well. Um, Ryan, do you know whether these individuals are all having their prosthesis on the inside or the outside of the turn? Yeah, so <clears throat> the three participants all had right leg amputations, um, but we ran them, or we had them run uh, counterclockwise and clockwise. Um, so the results I presented today are kind of combined for whether or not the prosthesis is on the inside or outside of the curve. That's been shown to be have an effect on you know um, curve sprinting performance and maximal speed, but the number I report and that result is kind of independent of curve uh, direction. So it, I think it will be offset, but those differences between solid and split should be similar. So, so do you do you know anything? About, did you compare them ever yet with the, with this sample size? Whether they're in your case, with specifically looking at the type of prosthesis, whether the difference is bigger on the inside or the outside? Yeah. So with our current setup, we couldn't we wouldn't be able to separate whether or not the prosthesis is on the inside or outside from the, them running in a different direction. Um, but, you know, that, that's something that we could do is now find some individuals with a left leg, uh, you know, amputation and repeat the study and then we can make some comparisons, but we haven't done that. All right. Then we got an, another question from Adam, who is a student at Humboldt, uh, which I know, but nobody put in uh, the chat yet. Um, so he was wondering whether uh, banking um, of the indoor tracks, uh, would that affect the outcomes? Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't mention it in that presentation, but these were flat turns, and it's um, it's unusual to have a 200 meter indoor flat you know track. But um, I would I would think that yes, yes, centripetal force production re you know requirements are going to change as that slope of the track increases. Right. We had a we had another question from Austin, which kind of we talked about with Eric's question, which was the left or right side, and you said that everybody was on the right side. Um, and then Shalea Kip um, wonders um, if you know um, in uh, Paralympic sprinting <clears throat> over distances that include turns, um, whether there is an effect of lane on the outcomes. I don't know. Um, physics would say that lane eight should be faster, right? You have a larger turn radius, but um, that's not the only determining factor. You've got um, preferences for the runner, whether or not they want to be chased or they want to chase. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, but it's an interesting question for sure. And now I need to do some catch up because some people have been asking Janet questions. Uh, Um, so yeah, so we got a question from Dale who's wondering, um, Janet, is there any evidence that um, uh, participants, um, that it would be different results for bilateral amputees than, and unilateral amputees? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, so, so far I haven't found any literature comparing the energy expense uh, energy meta metabolic cost between two prosthesis conditions in bilateral transfemoral amputations, probably because a very small group of the population. But uh, I think that's also one of the reasons I think the fur further research would be very important for this topic because uh, we're not sure if the reduced metabolic cost is because uh, increased uh, symmetry between in run gate or is simply because a reduced peak hip abduction will help with a uh, more efficient running economy. Uh, so in that case, it's really hard to give an answer at this moment. Yeah. So we got another question for, uh, for Janet from uh, Dr. Hiro Abara, uh, and he's wondering uh, whether you know anything about uh, injury risk for the, the prosthesis where the knee is locked. 
uh, one injury risk uh, is a lot of injury risk is probably due to the asymmetr asymmetrical gait in the no knee condition um, because of the asymmetrical gait. So that it will increase the loading in the unaffected set and leading to injuries such as uh, knee osteoarthritis or hip osteoarthritis. Great. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up the session. So this would typically be the moment where everybody's sort of leaving the room and then some of the shy people would go forward and start asking questions in a virtual condition. Um, you have to be uh, less shy and, and start sending those emails, try to put them in the chat. We have the Slack channel, try to um, hook up uh, with some of the speakers that might be in some of the spatial chat rooms. You can even send them an email to meet you there. Then you can talk face to face. Um, but uh, yeah, that's I think all the options we have. So I thank all the participants for um, their great questions. I thank all the speakers for the great presentations and I'm looking forward to the remainder of uh, this uh, ASB conference.